Hey guys, my name is Sarah, if you haven't met me already, and I'm going to be one of your near peers for CSI this week. And today we're going to be talking about handwriting analysis. As you know, there was a note left at the crime scene next to the flowers on Junebug's dresser that said, don't go, it will be a mistake. So we're going to figure out who wrote that using our handwriting an analysis skills. So real quick, just some objectives. By the end of this presentation, you will have learned the process of handwriting analysis, you will have mastered the terminology used in handwriting forensics, and by the end of our lab, which will follow this, you will have examined handwriting examples for similarities and differences, and you will have determined the writer of the note found at our crime scene. So before we start, just a quick reminder, when we see this magic magnifying glass, that's when we take notes. Um, those things are going to be what's on our codes, what's on our worksheets. So it's important that you know those and that you write those down somewhere, whether it be a notebook or a piece of paper you have beside you. So without further ado, let's get into it. So why do we even analyze handwriting? Well, it's often left behind the scene. And not only can it tell us maybe what's going on through the message, we can figure out who was around, what the situation was. Also, handwriting is very distinct. Every single person has different handwriting. For example, I have different handwriting than you do, right? And the reasons for this, there's, there's a couple different reasons. First of all, there's a writing instrument. For example, when I write in pen versus pencil, my pen handwriting is so much messier than my pencil handwriting. The same thing can be said for maybe when you write with a pencil versus a crayon. It's completely different. Another thing is age. I remember my third grade teacher bless her heart, she had the most gorgeous handwriting I had ever seen. It is the most perfect loopy cursive, and I always wanted a handwriting like that. However, my handwriting at that age was basically just chicken scratch. It was print, and it was illegible, and no one could read it. Age is one that definitely contributed to that. Another thing is mood. So when you are happy and when you are excited, your handwriting is going to be different. It's going to be slightly more spaced apart and it's also going to flow off the line a little bit versus if you're sad or serious, it's going to kind of stick together and be a little bit smushed and smaller and stay on the line. And finally, one of the more obvious ones when you're in a hurry. And this can tell us more about the situation that was happening at the scene. When you're in a hurry, your handwriting is obviously going to be more messy, right? when you are at the end of a test and you are writing furiously to finish up your sentence, it's going to be very different from when you're at the beginning of the test and you're just thinking about your opinion and you are being very slow. And for that reason, it can also contribute to the variations in handwriting. Now, a document expert is the name of a person that scientifically examines that handwriting. So we're, we're all going to become document experts by the end of this presentation. So you might be thinking, Sarah, how much does a document expert actually have to do? I mean, like, it's not there's many crimes that have to do with handwriting. There actually are. One of the biggest ones is forgery, copying someone else's handwriting or especially signature on an official document. And this can be as big as writing someone's signature on a contract that makes them lose a million dollars to say something more relatable to us, like maybe forgetting your permission slip on a field trip and just writing your dad's signature on there because you know no one's going to tell. Those are both actually crimes. Those are examples of forgery. Now, if you have literary forgery, that means you're copying someone else's handwriting to make a fake historical document. Let's say you are have you have a, you wrote a fake constitution and you want to sell it on eBay. That would be literary forgery if you're passing it off as real. Now, if you actually go through and sell it and and make some money, that would be fraudulence, forgery in which money is made by the criminal. So fraudulence is forgery plus money. Then we have counterfeiting. So counterfeiting has to do with usually money. Um, it's when false documents are created for deception. It can include passports, green cards, visas, any of those immigration papers, money, or even artwork. I've heard a lot about counterfeiting artwork lately. And then finally, we have obliteration, which is the removal of writing by physical or chemical means. So let's say someone writes... I give all the money to Sarah and Tom. And let's say I want all the money. So I'm going to take out and Tom. I'm going to obliterate it. And so it just says, I'm giving all the money to Sarah. That would be a, a example of obliteration, which would be a crime, obviously. So those are things that can be investigated by a document expert. 
Now let's actually go through and analyze things. So the three main ca categories of in analysis used by handwriting analysts are letter form, line form, and formatting. So letter form means how does the writer shape their alphabet? So for example, there are a couple of different ways to write an A, right? So there's this version, and then there's this version, correct? So which one is it? That would be an example of letter form. Now line form means how does the writer shape their line? Does it kind of stay on the same level or does it kind of float off? Or does it kind of sink into it? Those are examples of line form. And finally, we have formatting. How does the writer place their letters? So I'm gonna move my face a little bit so we can see this document over here on the right. And as you can see, these letters, they're not going too far off the page on this side. There's a margin, which is an example of formatting. And on top of that, it's pretty close together. That's also an example of formatting, spacing. Now, there are five other things that handwriting analysts use within those three categories that help them distinguish between the differences in handwriting. The first thing is size. What are the height and width of the letters? So as you can see here, um, Jack and Jill went to the hill. That's some pretty medium-sized handwriting, I would say. But something to look at is the ratio of height of the short to tall letters. So as you can see here, the A is maybe a little bit less than half the height of the J. Over here in Hill, however, the L's should be around the same size as the H's, but it's obviously not. The L's are shorter. So that would be something that's very distinct in the size of this person's handwriting. Next, we have print versus cursive. Are the capital letters connected to lowercase letters? Is there a mix of both print and cursive writing? Um, as you'll see when you analyze my handwriting later in the lab, my handwriting is a mixture of both print and cursive. I talked about my third grade teacher earlier. She convinced me to write somewhat in cursive, but still somewhat in print. That's a mix that's very distinct towards me. No one else has a mix like I do. And you probably write in a mix like that yourself. So when you think, talk about print versus cursive, you're thinking about are the capital letters connected to lowercase letters? And is there a mix? And what kind of mix is it? And next we have slope. Is there a slant to the left or right? Or do they have no slant at all? Here's the top line, which is right slant to letters. We're going to draw parallel lines to the words, to the J's and the K's, to the J over here and Jill and the L, um, to the T. As you can see, all these lines are kind of pointing up and to the right, and it's staying within that sort of parallelogram that we're making. That is a big sign of a right slant to the letters. Now down here where it says left slant to letters, um, I honestly think it's either left slant or no slant because I can draw straight lines and it'll stay in there for the most part. So this is a very big sign that there is no slant. And very rarely do you see no slant. And in addition, slant can give you a pretty big insight onto the speed and the hurriedness of the person that's, that's writing it. Because obviously when you're hurried, you're going to be writing more to the right because, I mean, you're trying to get through the sentence. So that's an, another thing that's important to look at. We're talking about the situation that the scene was found in. So let's continue. How about spacing? How much room is there between words and letters? So I'm going to move my face sort of in the middle here so I can look down on both sides. Um, on the left here, we see that there is less space in between each letter, but more space in between each word. Versus to the right over here, we see that there is more space between each letter and less space between each word. So looking at the ratio of the spacing is really important because that's something that makes your handwriting different. And finally, last but not least, you have special characters. Are there any weird things that you notice about the handwriting? So here, this Y has a giant curl Q at the end. That's pretty weird. Some people have, when they write seven, they put a little line through the middle. I think that's pretty weird, too. That's a special character, for sure. One thing that I do when I am writing L's at the end of my word, like removal or carnival, that one L will be cursive, while all the, all the other L's will be print. That's something that's pretty weird about my handwriting that makes it distinct from any anything else or anyone else's. And that's going to be something that's going to be a good thing to look for when comparing handwriting samples. 
Okay, now let's talk about this phrase. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. This sentence is used a lot in handwriting analysis, and I'm going to give you three seconds to figure out why. Okay, guys, here's the answer. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog has every single letter of the alphabet in it from A to Z. And we want to use this because it helps us look at special characters. When we have the Z, when we have the J, when we have all these unusual letters that we don't normally see, we can exactly see um, what their handwriting really says and what the differences and special characteristics are. So whenever we get a handwriting sample, we're going to ask for this particular sentence, as you'll see in the lab. And that brings us to the end of this video. So if you liked analyzing handwriting, uh, you might want to think about these occupations as a job for the future. One is the forensic document examiner that we talked about. They, they're the ones that work with detectives and the police department to look at documents and see where exactly they came from. However, another one that might be a little bit more untraditional is an autograph authenticator who collects with collectors to make sure rare autographed items are the real deal. So, for example, let's say I got this shirt signed by my favorite artist, Harry Styles, and I want to sell this on eBay because I want to make money. An autograph authenticator will need to come over, look at the shirt, make sure that signature is the real deal, and then they'll give me a certificate that will be attached to my shirt when I sell it. And that, that makes sure there's no fraudulence happening. And that brings us to the end. And before I go, here's a quick follow-up question to think about. What's the easiest way to distinguish between handwriting? The similarities or the differences? Think about what you've learned and what we've talked about over this presentation, and I'll give you the answer to the following lab video. I'll see you later. Have a great day. Bye.